Generally, the Palestinian opposition takes the form of peaceful, non-violent protests, like in the village of Bilin and Nialin. But from time to time, it also takes the form of suicide attacks, when desperate young men, feeling they have nothing to live for, explode themselves in Israeli cities. There is no opposition to Zionism in Israel. There are only small, insignificant groups that remain almost invisible and ignored in Israeli society. And their focus is almost exclusively on the West Bank occupation and the Gaza siege. None of the existing peace organizations in Israel is concerned or even interested in the real causes of the conflict. One of the biggest opposition groups comprises of some 50 anarchists, most of them still in high school. They join peaceful Palestinian demonstrations in West Bank villages and end up playing cat and mouse with the soldiers pursuing them through the hills. Another group, Gush Shalom, is mainly made up of senior citizens just like combatants for peace and a few other tiny groups. Gushalom is not against Zionist policies as a whole. It only specifically protests against the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza siege. In this situation, it is hard to even determine how positive the impact of those leftist organizations is. After all, their very existence convinces most Israelis and the world that Israel is an open, free, democratic state. The real, desperately needed discussion about the ultimate fate of the remaining Palestinians simply does not exist. All the parties in the Israeli parliament, from right to left, are Zionist. In Israeli society, and increasingly in the outside world, it is only permissible to question the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza siege. Anyone who questions the occupation of Palestine and the catastrophe Zionism brought on Palestinians is ostracized, silenced, called an anti-Semite or, in case of a Jew, a self-hating Jew. I don't think that we can uh, implement a full right of return for however many Palestinians do want to return uh, and still maintain the integrity of the state of Israel as a democratic Jewish state as we in Israel would like to have it. So I think we're going to have to look for a compromise on the right of return. A compromise that will both acknowledge the suffering uh, and, um, and give some forms of reparation uh, and help Palestinian refugees uh, uh, integrate into where, whatever countries they are in today uh, and accept some back into Israel, but in, uh, will also have implementation on a level that Israel can live with and still maintain itself as, as Israel and not as the state of the Palestinian refugees. I am not afraid when I will be called to, to war if the Palestinians try to attack my country, I will defend my country like I defend my country against the Egyptians, against the Syrians, against the Hezbollah, against everyone else. I don't think that that should be our consideration when, when we go, go to think 
whether or not to pull back from the territories, because as I have already explained, every minute of our being in the territories is harmful to Israel, is exposing Israel for more terrorist attacks, and the Israeli Defense Force is not built to fight terrorist attacks. It is built to fight countries. Activist groups everywhere, of all faiths and none, who campaign for justice and peace, need to ask themselves some uncomfortable questions about how effective really they have been, and more to the point, what they must do to be more effective. In my view, there are two political realities to be faced. The first is that Zionism is not interested and has never been interested in peace on any terms the overwhelming majority of Palestinians and most Muslims could accept. The second is that the governments of the major Western powers are never ever, never ever, going to use the leverage they have to call and hold the Zionist state to account for its crimes unless, unless they are pushed to do so by informed public opinion by manifestations of democracy in action. Now, as I said on this very platform in November 2006, and I think it bears repeating, the problem throughout the mainly Gentile Judeo-Christian world is that the citizens of nations, generally speaking, are too uninformed to do the pushing. In fact, they are not only underinformed, they are misinformed, conditioned, one could even say brainwashed to accept a version of history, as Moshe mentioned, which is simply not true. And this has happened in large part because the mainstream media, like almost all politicians, is terrified of offending Zionism. Mm -hmm. Now it follows that if governments are to be pushed to do what is necessary to bring the conflict in and over Palestine to an end, if, in other words, the citizens of nations are to be empowered to take part in informed and honest debate, to make democracy work for justice and peace. It follows, I believe, that there is an absolute first requirement, and that is the liberation of the citizens of the Western nations. Liberation from the tyranny of Zionism's propaganda lies, upon which the first draft of Judeo-Christian history is constructed. The good news is that the tools to make this liberation possible are now available. They are books which expose Zionism's version of history for the propaganda and nonsense it is. The core essence of this nonsense is that there was no ethnic cleansing of Palestine, that poor little Israel has lived in danger of annihilation, driving into the sea of its Jews, and that Israel had no partners, Palestinian or Arab, for peace. Israel's existence has never, ever been in danger from any combination of Arab military force. And that Zionism's assertion to the country was the cover which allowed Israel to get away where it mattered most with presenting its aggression of self-defense. And itself was the victim when actually it was and is the oppressor. 